my best friend had just passed away in the January of 2017. I have friends that live in LA and they're like, Di, come over, you Same need a break. Day. So my daughter and I did take them up on that offer. The moment we get back, literally, just got off a 17 hour fly and he's behind me. All right, welcome back to our season two premiere of Cold Red. With me as always is Fitz. Fitz, I understand that you have two very special guests with us tonight uh, from the land down under. Would you have that you had the pleasure of working with a couple of years ago? Would you please introduce our guests to our audience? I would be glad to. And unfortunately, I met them through kind of a difficult situation, but I consider both of them friends now, even though we never technically met. Uh, mm -hmm. We've done a lot of emails and some Facebook stuff in the past. But uh, yeah, uh, I want to introduce Dee McDonald. Uh, she is a, a woman from Victoria area of Australia. We can get a little more into some of that. Uh, and she's going to tell us about her story. Um, she was a a stalking victim, but I'm not going to use that word too much. She's a stalking survivor. And we're going to get into that and her story as we go along. A wonderful person who took this situation, a very difficult situation, which we're going to break down and, and hear. Uh, and, and now she's doing a lot of work in the, within the Australian government, trying to tighten up uh, anti-stalking laws, things like that. And we will definitely talk to her uh, uh, in accordance to all of that. And my other guest is a uh, former detective with the Victoria Police Department. She was a detective there and she had this case um, put on her desk and we've all been investigators, right? You and I, we know what sometimes a, a boss comes in, here's a new case for you. And she had to pick it up where it was already a year or so old, and we'll get into those details. And she did an excellent job with it and really brought finally closure to a several year long investigation. And uh, and that's why these two uh, women decided to tell their story, share their story with us when called red. And, uh, and we're going to hear from them tonight, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how it all kind of was resolved uh, at the very end. Um, um, so... Ray, I know you, since I kind of played a role in this a, mm -hmm. a little bit, and we'll go into that down the line uh, in terms of some forensic linguistic analysis I did, we kind of sort of turned this over to you because I know you're familiar with the case through various media, but uh, why don't you kind of run and start and maybe even get a little bit more information out of Dee and Beck. Well, Dee, I know you're wor working with your government yes. on policies and procedures to try and increase uh, the penalties and the laws for stalking. I wanted to throw this out to you to let you know that in the United States, it wasn't until 1990 when California established the first anti-stalking law. So that's a little over 30 years ago. Yeah. Previously, yeah. they didn't call it stalking. They called it harassment, threats, annoyance, uh, domestic terrorism. Since 1990, every state in America now has anti-stalking laws. There is more than 200,000 serial stalkers in the United States, and there's more than 1.4 million victims of stalking. So uh -huh. my point is, is that it's a problem, not just in America and Australia. I'm sure it's a problem globally. It, when, it when is. You think of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I would love to hear your perspective of what happened to you. Okay, from, from the beginning? Sure. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I met this man back in October of 2014. He came into the store that I was management at. He just had an issue, so I helped out a work colleague with that. And then he came back with a rose to thank me and a letter and asking me out. And then he came back again with another letter asking me out and um, my work colleagues were saying, oh, you should go out, just go out for coffee. It's just out front of work. So I did. And that's how things started. Well, let me just back up one step here and tell me a little bit about you. I know our audience wants to know about you. Tell me a little bit about you. Who is Dee McDonald? <laughs> Who am I? Um, I am the oldest of two children. My parents lived in the same house for 63 years um, in a little suburb called Blackburn. 
Uh, my dad was a professional athlete, amongst other things. Uh, my mum stayed at home and my sister and I went on to further education and I left home relatively young. And, yeah, just not, not sure what else to your, say. Your dad's um, a lot like Jim. Jim was a professional student. <laughs> a little bit different than athlete. athlete. But anyway, so what when you you met this guy, uh, the stalker, or you didn't know he was a stalker at that point. No. But your first impression of this individual, what was it like? Well, he seemed really, really lovely. You know, I, I guess he had what I now know in hindsight, like this really fake persona that he was putting on. He was very charming and attentive and nothing was too much trouble. You know, we were going out for dinners or going out to see friends of mine in the music business perform. Um, he got to know a lot of them, you know, but he couldn't keep up that false persona that he had. So that's when the, the cracks started to appear, and it was relatively early. You know, I said I met him in October of 14, so by Christmas of 14, and especially Boxing Day, it was all done. He, he let his guard down. He got extremely jealous of my son. My son's just turned 30. and. Yeah, that was it for me because I'm nobody comes between me and my children. And my sister and my best friend Kathy Maney, she, both of them thought I was very harsh on him. So after about a month or so, I did take him back. And then for the next three months, just the controlling behaviour of him, I couldn't do anything on my own. You know, my mum was extremely sick at that time. So a lot of hospital appointments, surgeons' appointments, and he had to be there. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm i sure our audience would love to know, what did you determine to be the first red flag with the stalker that kind of you knew something just wasn't right? <laughs> there were a couple of incidences before the one with my son, which... I ignored. Like, he basically nearly run me over with his car. I, I We'd had an argument and I left his house and I was walking home. And he just came barreling down the road, flew over a roundabout. I don't know if you have roundabouts. I can't remember in America. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. And um, I just thought he's going to lose control of this car. So I jumped in someone's front yard to get out of the way. So that was probably the first incident, but I ignored that. Don't know why, but I did. And then the second one was with my son. So I just thought, no, no, this, is, this isn't right. This guy's, yeah, you don't get jealous of someone's child. So not at all. Not if you're a normal functioning person. Can I bring, bring Beck in here? I know you're not involved in the case back at this point because there's not even a police report yet. But can we just get a little bit of a background on you for our audience worldwide and just tell us uh, a little bit about how you came into the police ranks and law enforcement? And I'm just curious, and I know our audience would be how you got there and maybe what your different levels and where you were actually in 2014 when this was happening to D. Yep. So I, right back to the start, Jim, I'm an only child. I grew up in country Victoria um, and I joined Victoria Police when I was 20. So I was quite young. I think I was one of the youngest in my squad. Um, the squad was about 23-ish people then. And I think out of that, there was maybe six women. So Interesting. So not too bad. I think the stats are getting a bit higher um, in terms of equality. Um and then I graduated in 2011 and I ended up working in the country for a few years um, in Shepparton, uh, which is actually a very large country town. Before moving um, to Melbourne, I worked in Brunswick for a while. I did operational uniform duties, um, but whilst doing that, I did some secondments. I worked in the um, sex offence and child abuse investigation team in Shepparton, where I think that was my first exposure to victim-centric policing and I got my passion then. Um, and then I did a few other secondments when I moved to Melbourne, general crime and drugs and um, armed defending type offences. Before I became a detective in 2000 and, 
2017 where I worked in Broadmeadows in general crime um, before going across to the Hume Family Violence Investigation Team, which is where I met Di. So in answer to your question, in 2014, when this first started with Di, I was still in Shepparton as a uniform member. At what point did you become Detective Senior Constable? And that's a very specific title, I know, in uh, in Australia. And what, what's, is there just a, a junior constable? How does that work? So when you graduate, you're a probationary constable for two years, and then you become a constable after two years, it's first constable, senior constables, four years. And then your detective was obviously you have to be qualified um, to use that title. So I did, It's the process has changed a couple of times. Um, but from memory, I think I had to do a course first um, to be eligible to apply for a det detective position. Um, and then you have to do further study. So it takes a little while. It's even harder now. I think it's, they've dragged it right out. So the bottom line, before you even met Dee and her and were involved in her case, you had a pretty uh, well-balanced investigative career. It sounds like drugs, sounds like sex crimes, working with with victims and, and, and child victims, et cetera. So you had a pretty rounded uh, experience, and it seems like you were probably ready to hit the ground running when this case eventually came on to your, uh, to your desk. Fair assessment there? Yeah, I think so, especially because when I was at the um, Hume Crime Investigation Unit, which is Broadmeadows, I was in general crime and so doing everything. And there was many times I'd uh, have a case involving family violence. And at that point, there wasn't family violence investigation teams yet um, or units. So when that was formed at Broadmeadows um, and my boss at the time, Tanya Gallagher, was forming a unit, I was the first detective to go up there because of my passion for victim-centric policing. So that's how I ended up meeting Di. And that says a lot. And that uh, victim-centric uh, uh, mindset of yours certainly helped uh, get this case eventually solved. Ray, you want to pick up uh, with Dee where you left off? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Dee, I just want to know, I mean, we, we, we talked about some of the warning signs that kind of um, alerted you that something wasn't quite right. But what was the last straw that uh, that broke the camel? You know, the, last the, straw? Last straw? the last straw was my mother had a surgeon's appointment and Stalker's mother, were, she lived down the peninsula, so on the coast, and she was travelling up to Craigieburn, which is where we were both living in separate houses, and he wanted me to wait for his mother to get there so he could then take myself and his mother to my mother's house and then take her to her surgeon's appointment. Now, surgeon's appointments are difficult at the best of times, let alone waiting for someone travelling hours on public transport. So that, that was the end. I'm just like, that is ridiculous. You want your mother, who's in her 80s, to come and meet my mother in a surgeon's meeting room, waiting room. I'm just like, no, I'm done. It's too much. You know, he just wanted to control, yeah, everything. When our, our respective mothers met, yeah, it was just insane to me. That that was the end of it. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. I mean, here's a guy that wants to, his mother to meet your mother. While she's prepping for surgery or getting ready to pretty much, to have yeah, surgery. she was getting yeah. ready for yeah. I think it was a replacement knee surgery, and yeah, the last thing my mother would want to be doing is meeting someone. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Let's go out and have a drink before we have the surgery, right? What the heck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's insanity. I mean, yeah, exactly. So it it was more that you broke it off more out of anger that I'm just done with this guy. I yeah, just, I've yeah, because. I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't drive anywhere. Um, and he would always have a hand on me, like, you know, resting on my knee or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure why he did that. Everywhere I went, if we were sitting, he would have a hand. Yeah. I can't explain that behaviour, but, yeah, that was you know, I tell you, getting a bit too um, much for me. Here in America, we categorise everything. Everything mm -hmm. has a label to it, right? And we look at a lot of these stalkers and we categorize them and say, this is the type of stalker this person might be. And yes. after listening to what you're saying, 
this is the type of individual. We haven't even got into the crux, but it sounds like this is a guy who refuses to believe a relationship is over. And he, you know, many of these individuals have criminal histories. I don't know if he has a criminal history. I don't know anything about his background, but I can tell you without knowing anything about him that, Mm -hmm. and we get into this after watching, this was not his first rodeo. No, Um, no. It's, now, and it seems like, it seems like the, he was more interested in dominance and, and, and control over you mm-hmm. than he was in anything else. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, so, I, I had a lot of rules in place too in regard to, like, he never stayed overnight at my home or anything like that. You know, my daughter was 16 at the time. You know, I, I don't let anyone in my house, you know, especially someone I've just met. Hmm. You know, so I'm... Yes, so I, I found friends... out. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I when I did break it off, it was Mother's Day, and I pulled in the my driveway, and and my neighbour pulled in her driveway as well. So we were just talking over the fence, and I said, "If you see him here, can you please let me know?" And she's like, "Di, he's here all the time. He has keys to your home." And I'm like, "No, he shouldn't have keys. I haven't given him keys." And, yeah, so the very next day when I got into work, I was ringing locksmiths to have all my locks changed. And uh, so that was happening at lunchtime. And he turns up while the locksmith is there and just walks straight into my home because the doors are all wide open and a fight, obviously, ensured or an argument. And uh, the locksmith was going to call police. Then he left. But when I don't think he left completely, I think he just left my house but was still watching and he saw that the locksmith was leaving, so he came back. And I did ask him, how did he know that I was home? And he said that, you know, my staff had had told him. I said, no, they wouldn't have done that. They would not have done that. So then that night I sat going through my phone. I, I just was so paranoid that there was a tracker on my phone and there was. There was. And our, one of our top carriers here, I took my phone into them several times to have the tracker removed. And in the end, I had to get a new phone and a new phone number. But I asked them to keep that phone number that he had on my phone that he had the tracker on still in service so I could leave that phone at home and then go about my own business without him knowing where I am. So they left it in service for a couple of days. And then they cut it off. And that's when he turned up at work running around the car park looking for my car because he had no idea where I was or what I was doing. So my boss, my manager at the time, she was witness to that. So this this has taken an emotional toll, but you're also spending money to get this guy out of your life. With locksmiths, with phone numbers and new phones. I mean, this is how these guys try to get control of someone's life and, and yeah. just aggravate them and humiliate them and, and make them pay literally figuratively cash otherwise uh, mm-hmm. to, uh, to get their points across, to, uh, to it, keep this overall control over their person. Yeah, it, it took me a long time to work out how he got keys to my, to my car and my house. It took me like years to work that out. And what had happened while we were dating, I had an issue with my car. And um, so I walked to work, <clears throat> excuse me, and he came in for morning tea and I said, oh, I couldn't get my car out of my driveway. And he knew instantly what was wrong with my car and he said, give me your keys and I'll see if I can fix it. If not, I'll take it to my mechanic. Well, he had to take it to his mechanic because my power steering cable had been cut. So I had no fluid, which meant I had no control over the steering. I couldn't turn it. So that was when he cut all, all all my keys. So now I know not to have my house keys on with my car keys, just in case. So Beck, let, me, let me ask Beck a question here, Ray, then we can get back ahead. to D. Yeah, go ahead. Beck, it's sort of a hypothetical, but say D came to you with the existing laws in Australia. Say she came to you at this point in time and you happen to be the one that got her case or you took the complaint, whatever. 
and you know keys being copied, phone number, a phone possibly being cloned or, or tracked, whatever he's doing. Um, what could you have done at that point in time, if anything? And it's not your fault if your hands were tied and you couldn't. I'm just wondering with the laws, what would you have told someone like D uh, if she came into the station and, and talk to you and said, here's exactly what's happened, what we've heard so far. What would you tell uh, her or some other potential victim out there? I think all victim survivors need to firstly be heard and listened to with what they're saying because that there's obviously something going on and they need to trust their gut instinct. Um, so for me, Jim, because I don't let things go very easily, um, I would have absolutely listened to Di and taken statements and gone to every effort I could to try and prove what she's saying. Obviously, the difficulty with um, keys being cut is if I don't know where they've been cut, how do I prove that? Sure. Um, and tracking devices on phones, um, that's something that our, well, Victoria Police's like e-crime would have probably been able to help with. Again, I'm not sure how they prove it being put on there. There's there's issues, I think, with a couple of those things in terms of being able to prove it. But for me, there's many other avenues that even if at that point I didn't have enough to charge or arrest, there's things I would have been doing to try and catch him. For example, maybe Cambry's at Di's house. Hidden for that reason. Sure. Yeah. So I, sure. I think... To, to try and answer your question, there's always hurdles, but I think when someone comes to you with a story like Di's got, even back then, there's definitely avenues that police could have taken. Yeah, but as we'll learn more into this story, you when you finally got involved and had even a lot more evidence, your hands were still sort of figuratively tied. And we'll we'll come up to that in a, in a bit here. But And the same with U.S. Um, law enforcement. I mean, I was a police officer before FBI and, and even in the FBI handling some cases with some famous people, actually, who were being stalked. And uh, and, and back before the, the state stalking laws were enacted, as well as federal uh, stalking laws were enacted, it was really tough to um, to uh, to handle these cases and actually get any traction on it. Sometimes you'd have to knock on the door. And in the old days before the cameras, you know, the, the police uh, cameras and all, you could really read the guy the riot act, as we used to call it, and uh, and 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 put the fear of God or someone in him, and he would then back off. But uh, that you know, nowadays, you know, I, I get it. You can't always do that. They could, you know, they would be they would have their cell phone out recording everything the officer is saying at the same time, and all you're saying is, "Hey, leave this person alone." But they don't hear things the same way other people hear things or understand things. So, um, so Ray, you're doing a good interview with a, with a Di in terms of what's going on. Let's pick up. Yeah, Di, you know, uh, since we talked about the police and, and what the police could have done at that point, Bex kind of give us some insight into that. How long did it take you to go to the police? And what was the defining moment that you said, I need to go to the police on this thing? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't even drink of water. Um, so after I finished, uh, after I changed the locks, he kept coming around to the house. So I have a little peephole and everything, uh, so I would look and be quiet in my home. So that was when I called police and they asked me to go and get an intervention order, which I'm assuming is something very similar to a restraining order in the States. Yes. And I said, well, what, what, how do I get that? What do I need to do? And he said, well, just go to Broadmeadows Court and they will help you. It actually took me a couple of more weeks to do that. Thank you. And um, I went there after work one day. So I finished at about three o'clock in the afternoon, arrived at the courthouse, and there was actually no one in the courthouse. It, there was only staff really in there. I thought, oh, okay, this is good. So I just walked up to the counter, talked to a clerk. She gave me the paperwork and away I went. So I had an interim order granted that very day because, like I said, the court was quiet. So I was able to see a magistrate immediately and he granted the interim order, which is for 30 days. And then we go in in a month's time and then he complete his case to not have an intervention order against him. 
So that, so that happened in July. When we went for the full intervention order. So this is almost 10 months, nine, 10 months later after first meeting him. So I met him in went, October and then July. So seven, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, about nine yeah. or 10 months. So in that nine or 10 months, how many times did you get back with him? Sorry, what was that? How many times did you get back together with the stalker? Oh, no, no, no. No, that was it. After um, May with mum's surgery, that, that was it. I'd already okay. taken him back once. because Everyone said I was, I was being mean and nasty and horrible. Um, so I did take him back. And then that was from February to May. So in May, completely done. And that's when I had locks changed, contacted the local police station. I actually contacted them twice and surprisingly got the same informant. And he said, did you get that order? And I said, no, not yet. He said, well, I can't help you till you do. So that was really a prompt for me to go to the courthouse and really get this happening. And it was July that it was granted. So this is July of 2015? 15, yeah. And when does he start writing letters? Okay. So the night before we were in court, I received a phone call from Christine at the wine larder. And she had found a letter left on their wine racks. So I went over that night, the night before court, and I picked up that letter and I presented that to the magistrate. So this is our very first time in court together and I had one of the letters. So th this uh -huh. is the one where he, he says he's a private investigator and works in the vice squad. That's the very first one. And okay. like anyone that I know, well, that's younger than me, didn't know what a vice squad was. And I equated it to Miami Vice, the TV show in the 80s. <laughs> and, I, and I just jokingly said, what does he think he's Don Johnson or something? You know? Tubbs and Crockett. So, yeah. yeah. So are the police aware of this? What is the reaction of the magistrate when he sees this? The magistrate, he, he was amazing, actually. He... Um, I had a lot of issues getting a lawyer to help me, so I had to represent myself, but he had counsel. So in the end, he started talking over to the top of his assigned lawyer and just was talking or actually shouting at the magistrate about this letter. And uh, the magistrate cut him off and said, and I remember this clearly, he said, don't insult my intelligence. I know you've written this. I'm granting the order for one year. So that was, you know, I'm just standing there looking around thinking, oh, my God, okay, this is, this is good. So my first few times going to court, first two times, were actually beneficial for me. It was very stressful because I had to represent myself. I didn't have legal aid. I didn't have anything. So, yeah, it was so a bit nerve-wracking. this, and this is great. And mm. now you have an order that you think, great, this guy is going to stay yeah. away from me. Yep. What happens next? What happens next? One thing the magistrate didn't grant me was the 200 metres safety net around my workplace because it was his local shopping centre. So he couldn't come into work, but I work right down the front of the store. So his uh, lawyer was trying to uh, have permission for him to come into the store and do shopping even while I was working. It was in insane. So in the end, he wasn't allowed in the store, but he could stand at the front door if he wanted all day long and there'd be nothing I could do about it. I only had a five-metre safety barrier around myself, so he could very well just stand there and watch me work. But what he was doing at the, the shopping centre was going to centre management and constantly complaining about me. He was then also going to other managers in different stores in the centre complaining about me. And this went on for a very long time. I, I'm very stressful going to work each day. He was always there. I ended up leaving. You know, this is a position I'd had for nearly a decade. And I left retail altogether and went back into the corporate world just to hide myself away. Did that help you? 
Did that help the situation? Yes and no. Uh, the flyers became more prevalent. Well, he didn't know where I was. My work life became a 12-hour day with travel. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so my I couldn't park my car at the local train station because he'd already attacked my car there. So he had put what they call strip nails across the tread of my tyre, both front tyres. So that mm -hmm. caused major, major stress with the car. So I was driving out to a country train. So it was a V-line that actually originated from Shepparton to go to Melbourne each day. So they have two services every hour, and that's in peak hour, and one service when it's not a peak hour. So yeah, they, the trains weren't running frequently, so you know it was taking me up to two hours to get into the office every morning, two hours to get home. My daughter is home alone this whole time. Very stressful time. So the impact was huge for me. After the restraining order, after the after mm -hmm. the injunction against him. Ray, can I interrupt you? Meters. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. I just want to show, uh, we're going to put some of these up in post, but just here is one of the letters, and my markings are on these when I did my linguistic analysis. Uh, D, I believe this will be the very first letter to Weinlarder. That's and, right. Uh, yeah. And uh, some of this is my markings here, and he spelled invitation wrong, and there's yes, a few I words out. That. In, in there too. So uh, these are how, from a ling forensic linguistic perspective, I was starting to slowly mark up these things and, of course, compare them to the known writings of Max. So, uh, but you can see the, you know, this, <laughs> the letters get much worse, and you'll see the second one coming up uh, from, uh, I guess that was November. Um, that was found somewhere. We'd have to talk about that. But this is just the very first one here. And, uh, and uh, very Nancy and certainly uh, nasty and certainly. Uh, something this is a, a social environment of yours you have friends there and uh and they give you a call and say hey we found something kind of odd here remind me was this one was this on a pole or was this under a door left overnight that, how was it actually delivered that that one was um folded up and resting on the wine racks you know um the wine lighter also sell wine so they have rows of wine bottles so it was on those racks that it was originally found. And Chris actually thought it, because they have um, live music playing there as well. So she thought it was a playlist from whatever musical act that they had had that weekend. But when she opened it, she realized, no, it wasn't. Very tough. Um, uh, yeah, so you're now dealing with this. So is there any part in your mind <laughs> that says, oh, this is coincidental? And it has nothing to do with my stalker, or did you pretty much lock in? There's no one else in my life that would do this. Yeah, yeah, it was the latter. Um, I, because he had um, come into work, handing me letters, pleading to take him back, and all of that. And the writings were very similar to me, like the layout of it, because nobody tabs in anymore to start a par paragraph <laughs> yeah, that was how we were taught when we were younger but kids today it's all on one side yeah yeah you, you could be a forensic linguist it's one of the well, things i just, picked up on yeah just the the writing style not actually the words but the way it was laid out looked the same to me so instantly i knew it was from him and uh well, the I'm next letter get even, gets even more that. graphic I'm glad Red you helped him out on that, D. Yes. Otherwise, he would have been stumped. You know, so yes. I'm really glad you helped him. Hmm. You know, And luckily, she was around for the Unabomb case, too, and helped me. Absolutely, right? <laughs> I could have used her help, maybe. D, I, you know, I know that I want to know, and I know a lot of our audience wants to know, what's it like being, being harassed, stalked, publicly, uh, publicly disgraced? Yeah, just so that you know, what's that? What's that like? Very frustrating. It was humiliating. Um, yeah, to know that people are walking past and possibly reading all of this, and then wondering who I am, and you know, I, I was becoming extremely paranoid. My daughter was just arguing with me. She was calling her father, getting her father involved, and I have a really good relationship with my ex-husband. So, you know, that put a strain on what relationship we did have. 
uh, you know, my work life was insane. Just everything was just getting too much for me. It was too overwhelming. And, you know, this was was stressful going to work when I was still at at Big W. Yeah. I, I was in a really, really bad place. Really bad. It sounds like you're in uh, constant turmoil with yeah. every facet of your life. Yeah. Uh, your work it, it life. It didn't let up. Life. Yeah, your family life. Um, mm-hmm. And when does it come to a head and the police finally get involved that you were lucky enough to get involved with Beck, that she's okay. able to kind of come together and it kind of starts making sense for you? Yeah. So the catalyst for that uh, with Beck involved my daughter. We had, my best friend had just passed away in the January of 2017. I have friends that live in LA and they're like, Di, come over, you need a break, you need a break, come over, stay as long as you want. So my daughter and I did take them up on that offer and we stayed there for 16 days. So when we get back, at the moment we get back, literally, I had just gone to pick up my dog and was heading home and he's behind me in my street. I just got off a 17-hour flight, so I just I had my dash cam pointing out the rear window of my car, took some footage. I just sat in the road thinking, okay, that's enough. I'm just going to go home and went home and then I reported that to police. So they did charge him and we were going to court. But then he was saying that he wasn't driving his car. He was heading to a local, the person driving the car was heading to a local hardware store. But in actuality, if the magistrate had have looked at where the hardware store is in, in relation to my house, they would have seen that he was actually driving away from the hardware store in the wrong direction. But he said, you know, it was his friend driving. So that was then adjourned, and from court, he went straight to Big W in Broadmeadows, where my daughter was working part-time, and was in the store for nine minutes, running around looking for her, asking the store manager where she was, and eventually he left. And the weirdest thing, I went to work that morning, and I had started trusting my gut instinct. So I actually rang security at Broadmeadows. I didn't know what my daughter was doing that day. I knew that we were in court, but worst feeling. So I warned her. She knew what was going on. She had a copy of our restraining order. And I said, just call Broadmeadows police if anything happens. I had been assigned the sergeant and an informant. So with court not going very well, my boss actually offered to drive me home. So I'm at home. I get a call from Ash from security saying that he's at the store. I said, all right, I'll hang up and I'll call police. Well, the sergeant and the informant that were assigned to me were no longer there. In fact, they had been transferred months earlier and no one had told me. So I'm then ringing the member of parliament that I was dealing with who had put these police people in place for me. So I'm yelling at him that he stalker has now gone after my child. So he's like, leave it with me, Di. We'll organise something for you. And that's when Beck comes into the story. Interesting. And let's, so let's, let's back up a little bit and we can show some of the closer ups of these documents in a bit. Okay. And these aren't pretty, what I'm about to show. I'm just going to hold up to the screen. Um, but these are the kind of things... Was this outside the uh, the wine larder store? That bar? that was that was on the front window of the wine larder and and in another bar called Elwood Food and Wine. So that they were stuck up on the windows for passers by to look at. And there was a phone number and a person's name on there that, of course, we redacted. Yeah, uh, that was and, actually, and how... that was actually Kathy's phone number, my best friend's phone number, and she lived literally five houses around the corner from the wine larder. <laughs> and. Um... This notice went up. Yes. And it's a little Jim, tough to read, read here. Jim, you ought to read some of it that you can so that the people that can't see this can hear exactly what's on the Simply R.I.P. Kathy Maney. Yes, or, correct. Uh, where was that unreliable, cheap, tart D.D. when Kathy needed her the most? Guess D.D. will have to live with this the rest of her life. It's obvious the wrong woman passed away. 
RIP Kathy Manny. Can you imagine uh, Ray and any of us or anyone we know or yeah. love having something like this posted when a good friend died by whatever means? This case, we think she took her own life. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. But yes. who knows what this guy played into it, putting her phone number up on posters down the line uh, on other different uh, establishments. And then, uh, uh, you know, not too long later, she winds up dying in that regard. And he's putting these snarky communications out, insulting D and as well as um, uh, almost suggesting that she has some sort of uh, issue uh, or involvement with her death. So th this is really going down a rabbit hole uh, on, on multiple levels of, uh, of despair and frustration and angst. I can only imagine what you're going through here. And, um, um, and we're just around the corner from Beck getting involved with mm -hmm. these letters as well as some others and, um, and hearing how she, in fact, wound up on that case. And you know what? I think Beck's going to have some time to talk here. Um, let me ask Beck and Dee, would you consider hanging around for a second episode of this? We can sign off here, then come back in a bit. Yes. Sure. Ray, are you okay well, with that too? Absolutely. I, I want to tell everybody, please come back. We're going to have the second part of the story where Beck is going to knock your socks off telling you exactly how she was able to bring this to closure for Dee McDonald. So with that, Please subscribe to Cold Red for any updates and details about our, this season's programming. And with that, this is Ray saying goodbye. And Fitz, as always, is with me. Take See you care. In episode everybody. two. All right, everyone.